Well, I've been receiving a number of requests for Season 3, Episode 14, The Gentle Art of Making Enemies, which is exactly why I will review just that. But not until I've covered Smile Like You Mean It, you schmucks. We've looked at episodes from Seasons 1, 2, and 4 in previous installments, so let's dive back into Season 3 of Gotham. Honestly, Season 3 is a mixed bag. It still delivers on much of what I watch my favourite show for, however there are a lot of stories that I could just give or take. The Tetch virus went on far too long, the Court of Owls was just generally uninteresting, Jim's relationship with Lee was just too soapy for me this season, and Heavy Dirty Soul is easily the worst finale Gotham has ever had. Yes, even worse than the beginning. The saving graces of Season 3 were, ultimately, the characters made everything worthwhile, the Riddler's character progression, and the Winter Finale, which we'll be focusing on today. So, in the middle of Season 3 came the Winter Finale three-parter, which was neither a part of Mad City or the Hero Rise stories, but instead three more or less isolated episodes, and the central attraction of these three episodes was the return of Gotham's very own Joker, Jerome Valeska, who really needs no introduction. I've made so much content about this character that I'll really only just be treading old ground. Ah, okay, for newcomers I'll give you a rundown. He's a character inspired by the Joker that could never be named the Joker due to contractual obligations, and he's a character that this show has been both trying to sweep under the rug and relying on as a crutch ever since the end of Season 2, and he dies enough to give Kenny from South Park a run for his money. Right, you can subscribe now. It was announced that Jerome would be returning for these three episodes. In actuality, it was only two as his appearance in the first of the three episodes was simply existing footage of Jerome played on a screen. Really, guys? It was a great episode, but overall its only ties to these episodes were that it featured a cameo from the cult of Jerome, and it's in Smile Like You Mean It that we really revisit the character of Jerome and his story. So let's note what's already been established already in Season 3. So you don't need to do much explaining. Lee Tompkins got married, but the husband was infected by the Tetch virus, so Jim Gordon killed the husband to save Lee. Selina Carr's mother is back on the scene, and the Riddler is seeking revenge on Penguin for killing the love of his life. A man called Dwight Pollard, who previously worked with the corpses at Indian Hill, has joined the cult of Jerome with the intention of resurrecting him. All caught up? That'll do, pig. That'll do. So we begin the story with two morgue security guards playing poker as Dwight infiltrates the morgue with the cult of Jerome behind him. The security guards gun down several members of the cult, while Dwight remains unscathed doing his best Joker impression, complete with evil grin and cackling laughter. Honestly, I thought Dwight was going to end up being the replacement for Jerome when I saw the promo material for this. While I do prefer Cameron Monaghan in the role, Dwight certainly looks and acts the part. While I was predicting something of a passing of the torch story here. The other security guard turns out to be part of the cult and kills his fellow security guard, indulging in the humour of it and cackling. As the cult enter the morgue, we pan up to a shot of a Joker card. Another bit of trivia, Jerome is the only in-universe Joker candidate to be associated with a Joker playing card, and to have his name mentioned within this concept. So take that, Jeremiah fans! Dwight finally comes face to face with his hero, Jerome, albeit Jerome is still dead and frozen inside a tank. So I guess that rules out that Jerome made an appearance in the season 2 finale then. Huh, so who was that? Now, to be honest, I am glad that Dwight isn't the Joker more than I was before because I just can't deal with this whole he was a fanboy origin story idea. Also, when we see Jerome's smiling corpse in there, it's pretty clear who's king of this role. While witnessing the corpse, Dwight can't help but burst into maniacal laughter. I always thought this was perhaps just a little bit too cheesy. The notion that it's all contagious and that anybody that sees Jerome could just burst out laughing sporadically, I don't know, that just doesn't fly with me so much. Like, I got that whole pun in Season 2, there's nothing more contagious than laughter. Yeah, that is something that's commonly associated with it, but at the same time, like, that is just a saying. Jerome is, at the end of the day, a person and not just a manifestation of the philosophy of laughter. If you wanted to do that, you shouldn't have given him a real name and a backstory. Well, anyway, on that note, the titles roll. The GCPD investigate the morgue to see that Jerome has been stolen and the insignia of the cult has been left behind all over the cryogenic tank that Jerome was inside. It becomes terrifyingly clear that the resurrection of Jerome is absolutely possible. Back at Wayne Manor, Cole Clements, an associate of Selina Kyle's mother, is bargaining with Bruce Wayne and Alfred for money, or else the mother of Selina Kyle, Maria Kyle, will be incarcerated. In previous episodes, it seems that Maria Kyle and Selina Kyle have been getting a little closer as a mother and daughter, so obviously Bruce doesn't want her incarceration on his conscience. Back at the GCPD, tensions are high between Jim Gordon and Lee Tompkins over the death of Lee Tompkins' husband, Mario Calvi, and James Gordon interrogates a member of Jerome's cult, who seems extremely impressed and excited to be meeting James Gordon, who just wants to know where Jerome's corpse has been taken. 
He too does a cheesy Joker impression, and then we cut to the reawakening with Dwight. Dwight is hooking Jerome's corpse up to a set of state-of-the-art machinery. I mean, it must be state-of-the-art if it's able to restore life to a corpse. Dwight then recites Jerome's infamous line, Hang on to your hats, folks, because you ain't seen nothing yet. Now, don't get me wrong, I do really enjoy this story, but I must admit it certainly doesn't live up to the quality of Jerome's season 2 stories in terms of dialogue and writing. The cult of Jerome thing and their constant quoting just comes off as a bit self-indulgent and self-congratulatory? Yeah, we get it, it's a great speech, but you're getting your own brown on your own noses here, guys. Anyway, the experiment begins, as does the excitement, while Dwight breaks out into uncontrollable laughter again. We revisit Penguin, who's having slam piece articles on his mayoral term read to him by Barbara Keane. Barbara Keane encourages Penguin to take some actions to reinstate himself as the King of Gotham without the help of Ed Nigma. It seems as though she's working for Penguin in this story for her own survival, you'd think. We return to Wayne Manor where Bruce is paying off Maria Kyle, while Selina Kyle believes that Cole Clements should be arrested as opposed to paid off. Maria decides that it's the best thing maybe for her to just leave. Back at the GCPD, Jim Gordon and Bullock investigate. I must admit that compared to previous episodes that I've reviewed for the Best of Gotham series, this one definitely has a lot more expositional story fluff. This kind of explains that the Jerome philosophy is a lot bigger than they'd expected. It goes beyond just the cult. Lucius Fox explains that to resurrect Jerome would cause power surges, and that there have been multiple power surges across the city. Jerome's resurrection is already well underway. Worse yet, there are even members of the cult of Jerome within the GCPD itself. I've mentioned in a previous video why the cult of Jerome thing doesn't really work on this scale. It's clearly taking cues from the Dark Knight where the Joker is more of a philosophy of war, paint, and chaos. But the thing is, with Jerome there's an actual identity and a coherent backstory, so this just doesn't work because there's more to Jerome than being the Joker. But I guess they just want to have their cake and eat it anyway, I mean why not, I mean like who, who even cares at this point? So one of the other members of the cult goes to Dwight to inform him that the GCPD have the location but is confused as to why Jerome is still dead. Dwight begins to panic having attempted everything to ensure the resurrection works and yet Jerome remains dead. Dwight is feeling the pressure as he promised them the second coming of the Prophet of Jerome, and yet Jerome is just not awakening, sleepyhead. He gets arrested by the GCPD in the credits roll. Nah, just kidding. He instead kills his fellow cult member and takes something the cult member said to heart. They want to see his face, right? So Dwight moves over to plan B. Remove Jerome Valeska's face and instead, wear it like a mask. I definitely prefer this version of the cut of face story to the gratuitous version where the Joker decides he wants to cut it off himself because, I don't know, he's an edgelord. I mean, come on, here he doesn't exactly have much of a choice. Jim Gordon and Harvey Bullock arrive at the scene after Dwight flees to find that the body of Jerome lay there with its face removed. So, the moment of truth is here for the cult of Jerome. Dwight must present the return of the prophet, and it's just Dwight wearing Jerome's face as a mask. I really love this scene. The excitement in the cold changes to disappointment and then to frustration. You can really get a sense of how nervous Dwight is here, as his own cult look to be turning on him. Dwight insists that the prophet is here and that he is Jerome. And, you know, like, he represents the second coming of Jerome because Jerome lives on in them all together. As they all begin chanting, we are Jerome, which is... Definitely an homage to that whole we are the Joker thing, and uh, one which just doesn't work again because of the nature of Jerome as a character, but hey hey. Meanwhile, Jerome's corpse is escorted to the GCPD under the care of Lee Tompkins when, uh-oh, we see a finger twitch. Lucius Fox breaks the news to Bullock that there's a mole in their ranks, that there's a part of the cult inside the GCPD. As Jim Gordon announces to the GCPD that there's a mole, the mole outs himself before Jim Gordon can as he makes a run for it and is arrested. It ends up being a bluff from Jim Gordon pretending that he could trace the phone call of the mole. Pretty clever. I do like when Gotham does bait and switch stuff like this. So Penguin shows up to his meeting with Barbara Keane at her bar, all cleaned up and looking more like himself. Penguin thanks Barbara for her help as she persuades him to take down two gang leaders in Gotham City to assert power. Penguin sees past Barbara's attempts at manipulating him for power, and it transpires that Barbara wasn't really bluffing, or so it would seem, as she's phoned by Tommy Bones, who tells Penguin that they have Nigma as a hostage. So Penguin is going to save Ed, right? But the next twist, Barbara is in cahoots with Tommy Bones, who is in cahoots with Tabitha Galavan, and it's all a trap for Penguin, the old switcheroo. 
Tabitha kills Tommy Bones, and that's because his work is done. Meanwhile, Harvey Bullock and Jim Gordon interrogate the mole. It's tragic because this cop defended the GCPD when it was under attack from Jerome and the Maniacs, but the mole declares that the night that happened was the night that he changed, and he was no longer a cop. I'm sorry. I just find it so difficult to suspend my disbelief this far. I find it so difficult to roll with this whole idea that one look at Jerome can turn a person into a psychopath. I'm sorry, but this is one of the stupidest things that Gotham has pulled. As the interrogation goes south, the mob starts doing a Jerome impression of his very own as Harvey begins to lose control. Lee Tompkins instead comes in and injects him with a sedative that will make him expose the cult of Jerome. Man, this is my problem. I feel like Gotham definitely became more indulgent in its more ludicrous, sort of surreal side come season 3. The surreal and twisted was something that was always there in Gotham's blood, but I feel like it's really starting to indulge in it and becoming too self-aware. So then Lee Tompkins criticizes Jim Gordon for not enforcing the law by the book as tensions flare further. The mole gives Harvey the location of the cult of Jerome and where they're heading, and they're headed for the Channel 9 News. The cult invade the news station with a shootout as they prepare to broadcast the Gospel of Jerome. Lee Tompkins returns to the GCPD morgue to find the corpse of Jerome is gone. He's behind you. Jerome is back and he takes a hostage. Jerome takes a moment to reflect on things with Lee Tompkins, who attempts to trick Jerome into shooting himself, but he knows a bit better than that. Jerome takes a moment to appreciate his cult before choking on his neck wound, courtesy of Theo Gallivan. Cameron Monaghan's return as the lovable and sadistic Jerome is as charismatic as ever and more grotesque than ever before as he wanders around with his face removed and bandages over his head. There's kind of a Joker homage here in his appearance in that he's got most of his head covered in white bandages and the exposed muscle tissue makes a red smile shape. Nice, nice little reference there. Seeing Jerome's response to the recent events in Gotham is a lot of fun and Cameron Monaghan's performance has taken a ghoulish change. His voice is more raspy due to the cut in his neck which makes him sound a little bit closer to Mark Hamill's Joker which is a nice touch. Jerome finds every little detail hilarious, and the performance is so good that you can't help but laugh along, which I get was the point of this whole cult of Jerome thing, but there comes a point when it's just getting too self-aware. Jerome wants two things, to know where his face is, and to continue where he left off and kill Bruce Wayne. Sorry, had a, had a yawn attack there, it's got nothing to do with the episode. The GCPD surround Channel 9 News, as the cult of Jerome have a hostage. We return to Maria Kyle handing the money over to Cole, as it's revealed that the two were working together in cahoots to extort Selina, Carl, and Bruce Wayne for money. And fortunately, for every audience member with moral fibre, it turns out Selina Kyle was listening in on the whole thing. She caught the two in the act and sees to it that justice is served. This hits home for me, but there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Selina's arc is one of the best in this story, to be honest, as it treats a serious matter of toxic parents with the dignity that it requires. We return to Dwight inside the Channel 9 TV studio preparing for his TV debut as Jerome, and he receives a phone call from Jim Gordon. Rather than conversing, Dwight, like the fangirl he is, instead opts to recite Jerome's dialogue from the Children's Hospital benefit before Jerome died. His delivery is terrible, deliberately from the actor playing Dwight, so it's actually a good performance all in all. Worth noting, he does misquote, which is a nice touch. Not sure if that was deliberate. Dwight claims that he is Jerome and that Jim Gordon then mocks him with a great line of dialogue. Well, you're doing one thing Jerome never did. You're boring me. Great line. I love it. So then we return to Barbara Keen and Tabitha Gallivan, who have fabricated an entire plan against Penguin to get him into the hands of Enigma for revenge. It's all a power play to get all the gangs to kill one another. And then they murder a number of Penguin's officials, it would seem. So Dwight makes his broadcast to enlist the entirety of Jerome's followers together. Jerome sees the broadcast and is pretty unimpressed by Dwight and sets out to retrieve him. Jerome robs himself a police car and a police uniform and sets out. The GCPD successfully enter the TV studio to apprehend Dwight. Part of me wonders if Jerome getting the police uniform again was a throwback to season 2. There's a ridiculous amount of fan service in this episode. Meanwhile, Bruce is training at boxing and Selina chews him out for giving Maria the money and allowing her to extort Selina. Bruce only intended to pay her to reconnect with her daughter, and did not know how to break the truth to Selina. Selina attacks Bruce, but Bruce refuses to fight back, but he is excellent at defending himself. You can really feel Selina's pain here. Dwight disappears, and Lee breaks the news to Jim that Jerome is back. Jerome has both Dwight and his face. Jerome stops off at a nearby power station where he staples his face back on. I just want to briefly draw up a parallel here. In the DC Extended Universe, it's implied that the Joker, as portrayed by Jared Leto, had all of his teeth punched out by Ben Affleck's Batman after the Joker killed Robin, presumably Jason Todd. His teeth were replaced with metal ones, but he was so upset that his face had been damaged that he had the word 
damage tattooed to his forehead in a fit of feeling sorry for himself. Obviously that doesn't make any sense though, because when the Joker met Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn, he had both metal teeth and a tattoo on his forehead, yet it states in the film that Harley was an accomplice to the murder of Robin. But back to the point, he felt so sad that he'd lost his teeth that he had that tattooed to his forehead to mark, you know, how Batman had really ruined his face. Parallel to that story though, Jerome gets his entire face cut off, but he just casually staples it back on and moves on with his day. Another nice touch is that Jerome's face has sort of had to be stretched a little to fit, and because of that, his mouth is stretched into that classic Joker-like grin. Bit of a production goof here, but when we see Dwight wearing Jerome's face, there are cuts in the mouth, but here it certainly looks stretched. The makeup on the Jerome is superbly executed and looks iconic in its own right. While it shares its initial concept with the Joker of the New 52, the execution is much more subtle and creates a very different effect. Dwight is very nervous and asks Jerome if he's not mad about his face. Jerome responds by saying he's just happy to be alive again. What's a cut off face between friends? Hey, Dwight, he, he called you a friend. Did you climax in your pants yet? Jerome's got plans for a little TV broadcast of his own. Penguin discovers he's been duped by Barbara Keen and Tommy Bones and reacts accordingly, yelling and breaking glasses until he receives a phone call from Ed. Ed tells him that he's been kidnapped and been taken to Kane Chemical Plant. Back at the GCPD, Jim establishes that the cult of Jerome are rising. There's been a lot of looting and several crimes throughout the city. And then, hijacking the news, Jerome's ominous broadcast plays on the TV as Jim and Harvey watch. Jerome makes his nightmarish speech, calling upon his cult to do whatever they most desire, while he cuts off power to the city by blowing up one of the generators with Dwight attached. We also get a great final line from Jerome. Oh, by the way, I don't forgive you for my face. I love that Jerome is a total psychopath and yet he still offers a cheeky justification for killing Dwight. The GCPD failed to make it to the power plant on time and the generator is blown, blanketing Gotham in absolute darkness, rendering it a free-for-all for Jerome's followers to run free. Jim Gordon knows his work is cut out for him now. While Jerome's speech doesn't really live up to the one of the, you know, the, the you ain't seen nothing yet speech, it certainly it, it works for the story, I'd say, but I get the feeling they were trying to retread some familiar ground, especially in having Jerome wearing a police uniform while he does it and filming himself. As I said, this episode is very packed and very reliant on fan service. So that was Smile Like You Mean It. Sorry, I hate to disappoint, but I just couldn't review the highly requested gentle art of making enemies without looking back at the story that started it. It'd be so incomplete otherwise. So, I would say, is this episode worthy of the best of list? Yeah, no. The writing is definitely a lot sloppier than the episodes that I previously talked about in the Best of Gotham series. The writers can't seem to decide whether or not Jerome is capable of supernatural possession, or whether he's just a crazy kid from an abusive background. And having a bunch of impersonators running around quoting him is just kind of tacky and self-indulgent. At the same time though, it is extremely entertaining, and when Jerome does make his return, it's a lot of fun to see him carve his own path, or should I say face, and to see this character move in a new direction. I also really like the parallel between the subplot where Barbara and Tabitha are manipulating Penguin and Enigma for power, and the subplot where Selina Kyle's mother is extorting Bruce Wayne for money. Thematically, these two stories fit together, but there's a great deal of tonal dissonance between this and the Cult of Jerome story. I feel like Jerome was not originally intended to make his return here, and that they just wrote him into these stories for the sake of fan service. To be honest though, it does work, as Jerome adds a much needed splash of zest to the middle of season 3, and a detour from the two massive arcs that play for the season. It's a damned entertaining episode, but I can't help but be noticed that there's just a lot of conflicting ideas in regard to Jerome, and the way the co is handled comes across as more self-congratulatory than necessary. It's pretty obvious that these characters were based on Jerome's fanbase, but there's a distinct difference between appreciation for a fictional antagonist and worshipping a real-world criminal, and I just don't think Jerome's charisma was enough of a catalyst for this whole Contagion story to work. Sorry guys, I really do like this episode, I really really do. But this one just doesn't make the cut for the best of Gotham. Hopefully the gentle art of making enemies fares up better. Overall, Smile Like You Mean It delivers everything you could hope for from Jerome's ceremonious return and Cameron Monaghan's performance breathes some much needed life into season 3, but sadly the script is just too confused as to whether or not Jerome is a supernatural prophet of Satan or whether he's just the Joker. Unless it's some kind of riff on fantasism. For example, I read an article about a white supremacist that said he planned on killing every single gay he could find at Pride. Yep, yeah, that's a real story. Guy's a scumbag. And uh, next to his bed, he had a picture of Hitler. For a homophobic guy, that's kind of... It sounds like a certain someone's in the closet for Hitler. I only say that because I know it would bother him, though. The thing is, though, it's not really elaborated on with Jerome. And I don't really ha think the character has the relative historical relevance on Gotham. I don't know, 50-50 on this one. 
I'm probably going to put a question mark after where it says Best of Gotham on the title here. There's probably a reason why people haven't suggested this one quite as much. Anyway, comment below your suggestions for your favourite Gotham episodes. Next time I actually plan on looking at the gentle art of making enemies, but do let me know what you want to see for future reference. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below are links to the Patreon, where together we can produce better content. I really want to upgrade this, you know? I want to make everything better. I want to be able to hire editors so we can actually get more than just still frames in the background, maybe some artists or something like that and really just apply myself to this, you know? Time's always a factor, but hey hey, I'm not gonna obsess over that too long because, frankly, the support I get is fantastic. Anyway, also in the description below is a link to my Discord, a Discord invite where you can come and chat with me and some of my friends in this little lobby chat thing and everything is pretty relaxed. And you can talk about all things Gotham. So, on that note, thank you so much for watching guys, have a great day. About it. It's cancelled, dude. For real? You didn't get the notification? No, I didn't. Oh, well, it's cancelled. Yeah, well, I came all this way for nothing then. Hey, you, you wanna hang out? No. Uh, I, I just heard there was gone on Tracy. You gotta get out of there, Tracy. Tracy. Okay, so I guess the best advice I could give to anybody is this. Evaluate your circumstances. Be brave. Be prepared to fail, but always get up. You owe it to yourself to be marvelous, so why regret being anything less? Well said. I'll see you around, buddy.